Okay, uh, so let's start here. Uh, welcome everyone. Um, we still have some people joining us here. Professor Richard Albert, for instance. Okay, uh, so let's start here. Uh, welcome everyone. Um, all right. So uh, welcome to the UFMG seminar series on constitutionalism and democracies, democracy. Uh, the seminars are an initiative of the graduate program in law of the Federal University of Minas Gerais and the digital const UFMG content governors, governance research with the support of the UFMG Study Center on Transitional Justice, the UFMG GNAT Research Group, the UFMG Center on Trans Transnational and Comparative Juridical Studies, the icon -S Chapter Brazil, the Graduate Program in Law of the Federal University of the semi Ariad, uh, the Graduate Program in Law of the Federal University of Uberlândia, the University of Brasilia, and the Brazilian Association of Political Philosophy and Constitutional Law. Although the results of the presidential elections in the US indicated a point of constitutional resilience, the worldwide trend on democratic and constitutional erosion is still in place. Against this background, this constitutionalism and democracy seminar series aim to create an online forum of topical, vivid, and interactive academic debate. This series of events provide opportunity for distinguished, emerging, and early career scholars to discuss from the perspective of comparative constitutional analysis, the main concerns and challenges affecting the current constitutional jurisdictions around the world. In this episode, we will have the honor to host the, as the keynote speaker, our very organizer, Professor Tima Drunazzi. She's a visiting professor at the Faculty of Law at the Federal University of Minas Gerais, a professor of the University of Pax, Faculty of Law in Hungary, and she's also a doctor at the Acad Academy of Science of Hungary. She served as a professor at the Kenyatta University School of Law in Nairobi, Kenya in 2018 and 2019. Timia Drinozzi has been an independent expert of the Office of Democratic Institutions and Human Rights of the Organizations for Security and Cooperation in Europe on constitutional and legislative matters. Her works are published in recognized international journals, such as the Theory and Practice of Legislation, the Statute Law Review, the German Law Journal. Her book chapters appear in volumes published by, among others, Hard Publishing and uh, Oxford University Press. She is the co-author, uh, she's the author, co-author and editor, as also the co-editor of several books in Hungarian and English. Her most recent uh, co-edited book, Rule of Law, Common Values and Illiberal Constitutionalism, Poland and Hungary Within the European Union, was published by Rutledge. Her newest co-authored book, also mm -hmm. published by Rutledge, is coming out this September and is entitled Illiberal Constitutionalism in Poland and Hungary, The Deterioration of Democracy, Misuse of Human Rights and Abuse of the Rule of Law. Professor Drenazzi will talk about illiberal constitutionalism as a research agenda. To act as a discussant in this panel, we are pleased to receive our colleague from UFMG, Juliana Cesario Alvin. Professor Alvin is standard full-time assistant professor of human rights at UFMG, both on graduate and undergraduate courses. She holds PhD and master's degrees by the State University of Rio de Janeiro, and LLM by the Yale Law School, in which she was also a visiting fellow. She participates in the Sem Precedentes podcast uh, from the Jota website in Brazil. She has experience on strategic litigation on human rights in national and international organizations. And Professor Alvin published diverse articles in journals and is the author of book chapters, as also of a book entitled por um constitucionalismo difuso, cidadãos, movimentos sociais e o significado da Constituição. Uh, the format of the event is the following. Uh, Timia will have 30 minutes for her presentation. Then we will have uh, comments by uh, Professor Al uh, Juliana on 20 minutes. And in the following, answers to the key and day 
uh, by the audience mediated by the organizers. Uh, participants can use Zoom Messenger to make their questions. I would like to thank our team again, Ulysses, Ana Luisa, Bruna, and Natasha for helping us in organizing the series. The videos will be available on YouTube and we are recording the panels. So if you disagree with that, please turn off your cameras. Thank you very much for the panelists and discussed for accepting this inv invitation. And thank you for the audience for joining us today. So we'll be admitting people on uh, this Zoom meeting until 30 minutes of the panel. And then afterwards, everyone can uh, see the presentation in our YouTube channel. Please, Tim Timia, uh, you have the floor. Thank you, uh, Emilio, uh, for having me uh, here today as the second speaker of our UFMG seminar series on constitutionalism and democracy. As you said, I'm here today as a speaker, uh, not as a co-organizer, and therefore I would like to appreciate all the Brazilian sponsors and supporters, uh, but I just reconsidered myself and then I, I will not repeat what you have just said. It has already been recorded. So let me instead uh, appreciate you, uh, Emilio, and, and others, Ulysses, and the students, Anna, Luisa, Natasha, and Bruno. Uh, all of you made it possible for us to discuss the issue of um, illiberal constitutionalism as a research agenda. I am also very grateful to the Faculty of Law of the Federal University of Minas Gerais for inviting and welcoming me here as a visiting professor and giving me this fantastic opportunity to work together with excellent professors like Emilio and uh, Thomas Bustamanchi in the field of uh, comparative constitutional law and theory and Fabiana Menezes Soares and the uh, great young scholars uh, Carol Maciel and Tiago Hermont in the field of legislative studies. I am happy that I have outstanding students in my classes. I hope uh, to meet and collaborate with other colleagues and continue working with my students in our seminars. The first presentation in the UFMG seminar series was about some predictions of constitutional change and at the end, we discussed it with our first guest speaker, Richard Albert, who is here. Hello, Richard. Uh, that theoretically speaking, the constituent power is not bound by provisions of the existing constitution. If it is so, it would mean that if the Hungarian opposition won the election next year without a constitutional majority, but they have sufficient democratic legitimacy and put adequate uh, procedural rules in place, they could propose and adopt a new constitution even without respecting the existing rules on constitution making of the fundamental law of Hungary, which is the constitution. However, we are not there yet. We are not in the process of leaving illiberal constitutionalism behind. But you are here with me and Juliana Alvim, my discussant. Thank you all, and thank you, Juliana, for accepting our invitation. I am very much looking forward to your thoughts. Uh, so this is the time when I'm uh, trying to share my screen with you and start the actual presentation. I hope that you can see it. Uh, so first, I will talk about the first part of the title of my presentation, Illiberal Constitutionalism. I will begin with when and why we started our research project on liberal constitutionalism. Uh, and then uh, I will also uh, give um, a brief overview of how we conceptualize this term. The second part of the presentation will be about illiberal constitutionalism as a research agenda. I would start with some challenges we faced during our research. And I will finish my speech by offering some topics for further research, which could originate in our conceptualization of illiberal constitutionalism. Uh, so when and why we started our research project? The research on illiberal constitutionalism in Poland and Hungary is funded by the National Science Center of Poland. The principal investigator is my co-author, co-editor, and friend, Agnieszka bianca Tsala, who is also here with us today. This project is a three-year-long research project, which we finished this year, 
but we started the cooperation on this topic in 2015. Even before we started this project, we had already worked together on another one supported by the Visegrad Fund, and we thought that we should continue our working together. I mean, Agnieszka and myself. So what happened? We were shocked by the second electoral victory of Fidesz in 2014, uh, that the party achieved despite its demolition of the constitutional system and the first victory of the Law and Justice Party, which followed suit in Poland in 2015 and after. By 2015, of course, it was evident that Hungary has been in, a, in the process of some severe constitutional remodeling. As a constitutional law scholar who had been following the Hungarian constitutional changes very closely, I could absolutely relate to the feelings of my Polish colleagues from Torun and Luc. At that time, they started to feel similar confusion and dismay about the events of 2015 uh, to the confusion and dismay I had after 2010. Agnieszka and I developed an interest basically in two issues. You can see them there. The first was the question of how people could still support these systems. The second was an increasing curiosity about the extent of the deterioration. It is a deterioration, so it is a gradual process. We wanted to see if it both quantitatively and qualitatively approaches and reaches the state of authoritarianism, as many in the scholarly literature claimed at that time. We could see a tendency of authoritarianization, of course, which, however, had not, and we believe, that still has not reached the point of authoritarianism yet. We realized that Hungary and Poland had developed a new kind of constitutionalism, and for being able to describe it adequately, we introduced a new term, illiberal constitutionalism. So since I have a limited time today, and we wrote a whole book about illiberal constitutionalism, let me revolve around four important aspects. I will call them context, gradualness, emotions and values, and constitutive elements. As for the context, we attached importance to three factors. Poland and Hungary established their substantive constitutional democracy during the transition uh, process in 1989 and 1990. They are still the member states of the European Union, regardless of the severe resistance of these states to comply with the values of the EU. And they are also members of the Council of Europe. We also consider the gradualness of the constitutional remodeling, which is basically an illiberal deterioration of a substantive constitutional democracy a process in which Hungary and Poland have been taking similar, sometimes different, steps with different speed, but they are going toward the same direction by using the very same tactics and methods. As I said, we were interested in how and why the people support the regime of Orban and Kaczynski, so we dived into the historical and emotional trajectory and value orientation characterizing our countries and people. Substantive constitutional democracy, which Hungary and Poland had for 20 and 25 years, comprises the respect of the rule of law, effective implementation of democracy, and recognition and protection of human rights. Based on these and our observation on how the Polish and Hungarian constitutional systems have been operating, we propose new terminology. Because of the context, illiberal constitutionalism, this is what we say, is a stage in the process of authoritarianization of EU member states, that is, illiberalization of constitutionalism. It occurs in the post socialist region that has been hit by autocrat populist leaders in the second decade of the 21st century. It seems that the, the it seems that this is a legal and social reality, and it seems to be, and it seems to claim stability too. The gradualness of the deterioration and the embeddedness of EU law and human rights commitments 
regardless of their weakness and flaws, so their embeddedness in the daily operation, in the daily application of law, have kept these states from turning to modern authoritarianism. The normative appeal of the regime for the population finds its root in an unbalanced constitutional identity that longs for a charismatic leader instead of demanding a particular political philosophy. Consequently, we also suggest that this appeal could be satisfied by applying a patchwork of ideologies so far as a charismatic leader can invoke them to satisfy the current emotional needs of the polity. This normative appeal of the regime for the population in turn allows the regime to form a, from the constitutive elements of illiberal constitutionalism, which are illiberal legality, illiberal democracy, and illiberalization of human rights. So um, this illiberal constitutionalism as a research agenda meant several challenges. And I'm not talking about challenges caused by the pandemic or because Agnieszka and I, we are from different states with different mother tongues and that English is not our, sec is, uh, our second language. Instead, I will mention challenges which you face when you start to research a topic that has already been analyzed by many or when, when you want to introduce new terminology while at the same time you need to work with already existing but still contested concepts. And when you prefer offering the big picture instead of focusing on segments of the constitutional system and constitutional change to an academic audience that tends to focus more on a particular issue from a comparative perspective. Let me start with the first point. Reaching, uh, researching a topic that has already been analyzed. When we started the project, it was true that different aspects of the Hungarian and Polish constitutional remodeling and deterioration have been described and also theorized, but not from the perspective we wanted to use and not with our methodology. We believed that our perspective and methodology could offer a deeper and more comprehensive understanding of our constitutional changes and remodeled constitutionalism. How? Oh. Let me refer back to those elements I have already mentioned and that have not been considered by others in their works about Hungary and Poland. Emotions, values, context, gradualness, and constitutive elements. How could we be able to say anything about emotions and values. Connecting comparative constitutional law and social psychology is one of the innovatory approaches we use in developing our understanding of illiberal constitutionalism. We compare the Hungarian and Polish constitutional changes while drawing on the history, studies of social psychology on emotions and emotional trajectory of Hungarians, studies on value orientations of Hungarians and Poles, and the difference between value orientations of people living in Western societies and Central and Eastern Europe. How could we be able to tell anything new about context and gradualness? Our other approach was that we comprehensively studied and also appreciated the variety of methodology and different research results of the most important indices. You can see them here. Uh, why? Because we needed to use these indices uh, because of two reasons. The first, we wanted to do some quantitative research on how far Hungary and Poland went in their illiberalization process. And second, we needed to compare these figures on Hungary and Poland with that of other states with which Hungary and Poland are usually associated in the literature as modern authoritarian states. And how could we be able to say anything new about constitutive elements of illiberal constitutionalism? We introduced the term illiberal constitutionalism 
and European rule of law, liberal legality instead of the rule of law, illiberal democracy instead of liberal democracy, illiberalization of human rights and misuse of the language of human rights. So how to overcome challenges caused by the popular nature of our topic, uh, or if you do it, if your topic, have your own perspective, methodology, and be innovative. This brings me to the second point I would like to make here. The challenge is when you introduce new terminology and you have to work with already contested, contested concepts. I will mention here constitutionalism and then illiberal as an adjective and then European rule of law and illiberal legality. So this first is about constitutionalism, as you see. The most challenging was the theoretical approach to constitutionalism. There is a dichotomy in the scholarly literature, which is heavily influenced by the answer to the question of whether constitutionalism is intrinsically liberal or not. I think that for those who believe that constitutionalism cannot be disentangled from liberalism, our concept of illiberal constitutionalism remains an oxymoron and an incomprehensive concept, which is at the same time also misleading and capable of legitimizing an undemocratic system. Their main argument is that constitutionalism is, among others, about the constraints on public power, and they simply do not realize what kind of constraint on public power we can find in Hungary and Poland. It is because of two reasons, I think. First, they do not see the bigger picture, which we offer by focusing on, for, insta uh, for instance, emotions and values. And second, they fail to realize the gradualness of the deterioration and the context. That is, again, Hungary and Poland is still a member state of the EU, and that they had liberal constitutionalism for 20 and 25 years. Agnieszka and I we also believe that for this failure, the binary nature of constitutionalism could be blamed, which is also a predominantly American scholarly view. As I said, for those who do not disentangle liberalism and constitutionalism, constitutionalism either exists or does not exist. If they cannot use the term liberal constitutionalism to describe a constitutional structure and reality, they must label them with a term that is more or less the antithesis of liberal constitutionalism, and this is authoritarianism. Nevertheless, they feel that they have to adjust their use of terms to the reality of the 23rd century. Therefore, they come up with the concept of modern authoritarianism and classify Hungary and Poland together with Turkey and Russia as modern authoritarian systems. We view constitutionalism differently, um, differently from this predominantly American view, as we, Poles and Hungarians, received constitutionalism as a package. It resulted from the transition, so we, similarly to other non-American scholars, prefer to refer to the constitutionalism that emerged in 1989 and 1990 as constitutional democracy, which embodies the rule of law, democracy, and human rights at the same time. In our region, where constitutional development has been continually disrupted, democracy and liberalism and constitutionalism did not need to fight for prevalence. Addressing issues arising in this region, Central and Eastern Europe more precisely Hungary and Poland, without considering its difference, would lead to a simplified and restricted understanding of the recent constitutional remodeling. And we should not forget that this entangling constitutionalism and liberalism is not unprecedented or unheard of in the literature. Consider the works of Mark Toschnep, Graham Walker, Lee and Theo, or Helena Alviar and Günther Frankenberg on authoritarian constitutionalism, Hila Stopler on semi-liberal constitutionalism, and Eric Ip on hybrid constitutionalism. 
what did we do to overcome this challenge? We started to explain that there are powerful arguments on both sides, but the constitutional changes in Hungary and Poland since 2010 and 2015, respectively, should lead us to give more weight to the disentanglement of liberalism and constitutionalism. So we proposed that constitutionalism could be seen as a less of an ideology and more of a constitutional design that could accommodate various political moralities, philosophies, or practices, especially in those states in which liberal constitutionalism has already been present as a political ideology and a constitutional design. Illiberal is an adjective which has also been under theorized and mainly used in political speeches. So we gave it a meaning. Illiberal means for us first and foremost that the three pillars of the formerly existing a constitutional democracy, again, rule of law, democracy, human rights protection, have eroded. That is why we use it, uh, illiberal, in front of constitutionalism, human rights protection, and as I will explain a little bit later, legality and democracy. As for the polity, illiberal uh, indicates that illiberal constitutionalism can be established in a polity that is susceptible to transformative changes in a less liberal or illiberal direction by manipulative and populist nationalist rhetoric expressed by a charismatic leader. Even if the Hungarian and Polish remodeling does not mean that these are illiberal polities in which the community plays a role in forming personal identity and moral choice, this is what populist autocratic leaders intend to introduce by enlarging and triggering an already existing illiberal value orientation. As it turns out, society is not entirely averse to this in Poland and Hungary. Illiberal also means that there are illiberal practices connected to human rights, such as prioritizing the rights of the community or majority over minority rights, making the recognition of human rights conditional on the fulfillment of duties, a communitarian vision, a less egalitarian perspective and tendency of exclusion of others than us. Uh, homelessness is criminalized in Hungary. Women lost their pro-choice in Poland. They are not viewed as equal in any of the states. LGBTQI people are facing outright discrimination. They and migrant people have been used as a threat against its culture, religion, territory, and the population must be protected. Let me now talk a little bit about the uh, other terms, European rule of law and in liberal legality, because it meant the other challenge working with contested notions. So we wanted to assess the rule of law deterioration in Hungary and Poland, so we needed to establish a benchmark. However, the concept of the rule of law is contested and it is context-related and a perspective-dependent notion. So we decided to develop the term of, Euro of um, European rule of law because we believe that social reality and constitutional changes cannot necessarily be squeezed into our existing set of terms. Sometimes new concepts that best describe what you personally mean under a particular legal institution might be needed. So we defined terms. The European rule of law represents a thick or thicker understanding of the rule of law that has emerged throughout history as a common European heritage, value, and principle, which covers the EU and the Council of Europe as well. It comprises a particular political theory, which demands the prevention of any arbitrary use of power with all its necessary preconditions and implementation mechanisms. 
It also means a legally enforceable concept that is present in the national constitutions and the European legal order. Thus, in both the European and domestic arenas, the European rule of law requires the domestic law to bear some specific content, which would make it a good domestic law informed by the political agenda and decisions reached by the EU, so intrinsically its member states. It is a limitation on the domestic political decision make maker because there is another positive law, that is the EU law, that the holder of the domestic lawmaking power cannot manipulate. No domestic populist leader can hijack the EU law and lawmaking process in the same way that they might with their national legislation. Once we had this benchmark, which we call, as I said, the European rule of law, we could assess the Hungarian and Polish rule of law situation. And then we came up with this concept of illiberal legality, which is a nationalistic and over-politicized conceptualization of the European rule of law. It emphasizes the instrumental and opportunistic use of the law in both legislation and the application of the law. Illiberal legality retains formal legality, which is part of each thin concept of the rule of law, and extends to the application and enforcement of the EU law. The third challenge emerges when you prefer offering the big picture instead of focusing on segments of the constitutional system and the constitutional change to an academic audience that tends to focus on a particular issue from a comparative perspective, as I already said. So the most challenging part, both personally and professionally, has always been how to explain best the complexity of the Hungarian and Polish liberal constitutionalism and its uh, causes in a time frame offered by the organizers of conferences and webinars without having doubts on whether or not we have been perceived as supporters of these autocratic, populist, and illiberal governments. When you talk to an audience with the binary code of constitutionalism in their minds and argue that Hungary and Poland are still constitutionalist states, you draw suspicion because everybody knows that neither the Fidesz nor the Pislev government respects their constitution. It is also known that has been launched against Hungary and Poland because they disrespect the values of the European Union. Moreover, how can we use the term constitutionalism or constitutionalist state when there are severe attacks on academic individuals in Poland and institutional attacks on academic freedom and universities in Hungary? Or when we think about the media, judicial independence, and many other issues? The answer is, we should have a look at the bigger picture, like emotions and values, gradualness, which has given legitimacy to both governments. Let us not forget that so far, no elections have been to a large extent unfair and characterized by electoral frauds or non-competitiveness. There have been manipulations of laws, public media dominance, yes, but that was not why Fidesz and PIS won. And they lost elections too. Just remember the Polish Senate and some important local positions in both states. It brings us to the debate on undemocratic states of affairs, which is, which is the preferred adjective in the literature and illiberal democracy, which we use. Here, we have the same problem of whether we can disentangle democracy and liberalism. What we are saying is that our governments have not been acting in an undemocratic way. On the contrary, democratic mechanisms are used, democratic rules are observed, at least formally, and governments have legitimacy. We propose thus that we should not get rid of the term illiberal or illiberalism and democracy if we want to give a good account of our states. 
illiberal democracy for us means a formal, manipulated, profoundly majoritarian and non-inclusive democracy in which constitutional institutions, such as elections and connected electoral rights and principles, representations and accountability, and the central tenets of democratic lawmaking process are to a certain extent misused, abused, or neglected. So uh, some topics for further research at the end of, of my, my speech. Um, so connecting a comparative constitutional law and social psychology is one of the innovatory approaches we use. It might be useful to conduct more research involving comparative constitutional law and social psychology, maybe in the field of national and constitutional identity. Based on the unbalanced constitutional identity, which we are uh, having in Hungary and, and Poland, according to our research, it might be assumed that uh, there is a historically had belief and applied practice that Hungary and Poland are better run if there is a charismatic leader whose charisma is more important than their ideology. It would require further study to establish if this could create a basis for a distinct ideology or a more coherent political philosophy for illiberalism itself. This leads us to some important questions and maybe research topics. What is illiberalism? How illiberalism? populism and authoritarianism relate to one another? What is the interaction between constitutional and national identity in the process of illiberalization? How can we more precisely identify the turning point from liberal to illiberal constitutionalism and then from illiberal constitutionalism to authoritarianism? How illiberal courts influence the constitutional policies and constitutional change with special regard to the abusive informal constitutional amendments resulting from the decisions of constitutional courts. How illiberal tendencies in the lawmaking processes can influence the illiberalization process? What role the youth can play in this new transformative constitutionalism in terms of standing up against further autocratization and decay and illiberalization? What are the short, mid, and long-term effects of capturing independent research institutions and universities and attacking academic freedom to the society, economy, national security, legal system, higher education, research projects, grants, and so on? How can we retransform constitutionalism in illiberalized countries? Uh, I have started this presentation with appreciating the welcoming efforts of the Faculty of Law of the Federal University of Minas Gerais and acknowledging the professionalism and friendship of, friendship of uh, Agnieszka. Let me turn back to them now while talking about these uh, research topics, because some of them are not brand new for us. Agnieszka and I have already started to have a look at the role of illiberal courts and abortion law. Agnieszka, Emilio, and Thomas are the authors of articles that will appear in the special issue of the journal, journal The Theory and Practice of Legislation in Illiberal Legislative Tendencies and Regimes, which I co edit. With the support of the Bingham Center for the Rule of Law from the UK, I organize together with another editor of this journal, a webinar on the special issue featuring not only Brazilian and Polish, but also Hungarian, Turkish, Italian, and Indonesian examples. Uh, save the date, 20th of July this year. The four of us, so Emilio, Thomas, and Agnieszka, have already talked about the attack of academic freedom in Poland, Hungary, and Brazil. And we are planning a book launch events of our books. The one I co-authored with Agnieszka about illiberal constitutionalism in Poland and Hungary. And the one Emilio wrote about the constitutional erosion in Brazil. My other research interest is the quality in legislation and uh, logistics. So Fabiana and I have already started talking about some new projects. The first, hopefully in the row of many other talks, 
where I participate, will be a discussion about how reforms of the rules governing the lawmaking process influences the overall quality of legislation. This uh, event will be announced soon. You are most welcome to any of our events. Uh, thank you so much for your attention. And I am curiously waiting for Juliana's opinion, your questions and your comments. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Timia, for such a, an important and illuminating uh, uh, talk. It was really interesting. Uh, I think that uh, everyone in the audience have some uh, questions. I already have at least two, two of them. <laughs> Uh, but uh, let's wait for Juliana to her comments, and then we will get back to you for uh, a replica. Please, Juliana. Thank you, Emilio. And then I have the privilege to address my questions first then. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure and an honor to be here today and to be able to dialogue with uh, such an interesting and thought-provoking work. Uh, for this opportunity, I would like to thank uh, the organizing team and the sponsor organizations, and especially Emilio, and of course, Professor Timia Adrinoxi, whom I would like very much to welcome to our um, university. It is a great joy to have you as a visiting professor among us, and I hope this is a very fruitful period. Starting my comment, I would like to make three reflections on this very stimulating work being developed by Professor Timia and presented here. Uh, the first point relates to the expression, the phrase liberal constitutionalism adopted by you and your co-author, Professor Agnes Cabian Cacal. In your work and today's presentation, I note that uh, there is a great concern to conceptualize and explain this term and to refute uh, a contradiction that might appear to those who consider that constitutionalism cannot be disentangled from uh, liberalism. Uh, it seems to me that from, from the outset, this is already a high point of uh, the work that is helpful not only for analyzing the empirical reality of Hungary, Poland, Brazil, and others for what is crucial, no doubt, but also for drawing attention to the fact that uh, institutional arrangements, vocabularies, and even rights are contingent and contextualized and are always in dispute and may be subverted and appropriated by authoritarian conservative agendas. This phenomenon can be observed uh, not only in relation to constitutionalism, but also in, the rela in relation to the very idea of human rights and its grammar, its vocabulary. And here um, we just have to think, for example, of the attempt to appropriate human rights arguments, for example, um, in, in regard to fetus in oppose, and oppose them to reproductive rights of women, and also, for example, the defense of children's rights against a so-called LGBT or gender indoctrination, or even in the idea pervasive now in Brazil of human rights for right humans. So in this sense, uh, it seems to me that this apparent contradiction is very welcome and the discomfort it can provoke in some is fundamental because it, it allows us to overcome a transcendent vision of constitutionalism. Against this backdrop, my question turns to the very notion of liberal and illiberal in the work. Uh, by defining illiberal constitutionalism as, and I quote, I state in, in which the political power relativizes the rule of law, democracy, and human rights in politically sensitive cases, constitutionalizes populist nationalism, and takes advantage of identity politics, new patrimonialism, clientelism, and state control corruption. Uh, the, this definition makes me wonder how you see a liberal or liberalism in a constitutional state. 
Uh, would it be, by contrast, a constitutionalism that, is, that necessarily respects rule of law, democracy, and human rights, for instance? In that case, um, I would love to hear more about how you see the arguments that liberalism or new liberalism are crucial components in shaping this situation, authoritarian, conservative, illiberal that we see today. And here I refer, for example, uh, to Wendy Brown's argument that new liberal formulations of freedom, and I quote, animate and legitimize the hard left, as she calls it, and how right mobilizes a discourse of freedom, for sometimes violent exclusions and assault, assaults. Um, in other words, this cross fertilization between market and morality from an illiberal perspective would have generated, according to, to, to Hart Brown, uh, the political pacification of individuals and families by market and morals and subtended by the, in the autonomous authority, but depoliticized state. In Brazil specifically, uh, this means arguing perhaps that uh, Bolsonaro's rise to power had both a new liberalizing agenda as a necessary element, for example, through the figure of his Minister of Economy, Paulo Guedes, and also that he's also the result of this agenda, new liberal agenda, designed even before he took office with measures regarding austerity, reduction of state, deregulation of labor and capital, adopted soon after the parliamentary coup that inter interrupted the term of then President Dilma Rousseff. This uh, austerity and deregulation measures are in line with the neoliberal rhetoric of self-entrepreneurship and the progressive accountability of the individual and the family for what would be the role of the welfare state, such as health and education. Uh, in the context of Eastern um, Europe, it, it has called me called my attention that authors as uh, and Andrea Petro argues that uh, this illiberalism is based at the same time on a majority nationalism, on the rhetoric of freedom fighter, national capitalism, familiarism, gender opposition, and Euro Christianity. And that although to some extent illiberal regimes emerged as reactions to uh, disillusionment with globalized neoliberal democracy, they reproduced the same dynamic while hiding this fact behind a nationalist and anti-liberal anti discourse. Uh, in light of this, so I would love uh, to hear your view and thoughts of this relationship between liberalism, neoliberalism, and illiberalism. And also, if and how a possible mutually reinforcing relationship with this, between these elements, notions, can appear or be hidden by the expression constitutional illiberalism when used uh, in a way to criticize a certain state of affairs as opposed to a liberal constitutionalism. So that would be my first comment and inquiry. My uh, second observation would be about the processes through which this illiberal constitutionalism is built, about the element of gradualness that you've mentioned. Um, it's very, very interesting how you demonstrate how different paths can lead to illiberalism. As in Hungary, this occurred through constitutional changes as in Poland through attacks on judicial independence. And it's also very thought provoking in the sense how these changes can be more or less formal. And I would like to focus on that aspect. Uh, regarding civil society, the work argues that historically in Poland and hun Hungary, the, the people were unable or unwilling to form a strong civil society and to resist these misleading political campaigns. And also you, you call attention for the fact that progressively this fear of opposition was reduced over time, including uh, persecution of opposition members. So uh, my question has to do with uh, the civil society and also the informal means to which uh, illiberalism is built. 
um, focus on the civil society, not the one that opposes the government, but uh, the one that aligns with its values and may have deliberately contributed to this situation. Um, I have uh, recently co-authored uh, an article with uh, Professor Corina Mendes from Fiocruz in Rio de Janeiro, in which uh, we argue that conservative setbacks operate not only through visible and official means, such as enacted legislation, but also uh, furtively through informal rules that can reinforce, subvert, or overturn their formal rules, procedures, and organization operating against official uh, legislation. In, in that paper, we examined two professional medical resolutions enacted by Brazilian medical boards, which violate, violate ethical duties and the law. One is about um, this, uh, mandatory disclosure of confidential medical information about uh, patients, women, in cases of sexual abu abuse and rape. And the second uh, regards um, the refusal of medical treatment by pregnant women that, according to this resolution, should be evaluated considering the fetus. And, and these, were, these measures were taken by regulatory boards responsible for the control and supervision of medical activities, but that has become more and more infiltrated by politics and illiberal values. And, and this dimension also became very visible during uh, the COVID pandemic in which Brazilian medical boards insisted, insisted on innocuous and dangerous treatments, even in the face of protests by their World Health Organization. So, uh, well, I would like to love, love to hear your thoughts also on this matter, um, on this uh, informal subversion or contributions to this state of affair. You mentioned your research on abortion and I would like to, to hear, it would be very interesting to see if that also happened and also contributed to this um, illiberalization process. This, civil society and informal uh, measures. My third and final point is about the, the research challenges. I think uh, there is a, a challenge in talking about instability of constitutionalism and democracy from, from some position of global otherness in comparison to the global North, especially for audiences in the center as there is a prior expectation that constitutionalism and democracy in these places are always fragile, imperfect, and less rooted when compared to the center. So, and here uh, there is, it seems to me that there is always a risk of generalization when we talk about historical particularities and emotions that are mobilized by uh, in authoritarian and illiberal sense, because for a certain audience, they can be seen through the lens of the other, the picturesque, and, and um, as if this was not, would not be present, present at the center, or as if to some extent, it, it would not be present as a rule in politics in general. And, and here, I believe that the current, the current contingencies and, and the rise of Trump in the United States and also Brexit uh, made it easier or a little bit easier uh, in this process of um, relativizing these assumptions that this kind of things doesn't occur, occur in the center. In this sense, uh, I believe like your work offered a very, very interesting methodological solution to, to that problem by using as a benchmark the European rule of law for which uh, Hungary and Poland are both inside and outside. That is, uh, they constitute and, de and deviate from this pattern at the same time. And one could even argue that the EU turning the blind eye to these situations compromises its own rule of law in light of this violation. So, in that sense, uh, this option certainly brings a layer of um, complexity to the research. 
and possibly methodological challenges that I would also appreciate to hear more about. So with that, um, with these three points, I end my, my intervention, thanking once again for the opportunity to, to engage me in such uh, rich work. Thank you. Thank you, Juliana, for your excellent observations. Uh, Tima, please. Yes, I'm here. Uh, thank you, Juliana, very much. And, um, and so uh, first, I think that the relationship between liberalism and neoliberalism and illiberalism, I can recall that actually when we were in Santiago and the Iconist Congress, which was the last one, I mean, uh, as a physical meeting, um, and Agnieszka and myself, we were talking about uh, our research on illiberal constitutionalism and, uh, and Emilio and Thomas was there. And uh, one of you, Thomas, uh, just asked more or less the same question about like the um, neoliberalism and uh, economic approaches and how it could uh, influence our, our research results. And now I, I get the same thing. So I think that it is very interesting that I'm coming from like Hungary, you are Brazilians, and we seem to talk about the same topic, but you somehow approach it from a different perspective, which must have uh, its reasons. And I think that is very good, it's great. I'm very happy that I'm here and uh, I can talk about uh, this with you. And actually, since my being here in these two months or so, I learned a lot just by talking with, uh, with, uh, with uh, you and different other colleagues. Uh, to answering the question, uh, we, um, we left it uh, open. So we disentangled liberalism and constitutionalism for, from our own um, constitutional law perspective. And we opened it up to different uh, uh, interpretations and different uh, political philosophies. So basically, we are doing what we were advised not to do. We, that, uh, we just um, uh, take away this uh, uh, morality or philosophy from the concept of constitutionalism. Uh, but we, uh, at the same time, because we are talking about Hungary and Poland, we open up the possibility to invite as many uh, different uh, philosophies or, or uh, uh, moralities as possible. Why? Because uh, in our, what we are seeing in our states is that we had a liberal constitutionalism, which you prefer calling uh, substantive constitutional democracy, and we are uh, going down uh, in this slide down. So it also means that uh, we haven't lost uh, uh, everything we are just doing uh, worse and worse and uh, this is what where we uh, use these uh, adjectives uh, to uh, express that it is illiberal it is less than liberal it is not anti-liberal and but it is just something which is less than than before and uh, going back to the um, the actual question so as i said uh, there is no a real coherent philosophy behind uh, Orban's and Kaczynski's understanding of what they are doing. And this is one of the reasons why others who do not agree with our terminology are uh, saying that uh, this terminology is, is, is not as good as they think it is because it does not have any um, philosophy behind it, a moral philosophy. And I read this uh, article about Bolsonarism, uh, Thomas says, co-authoring, and I realized that, yes, it is the case. I, it seems to me that there is something uh, coherent, uh, seems to be some coherent philosophy behind what is going on in, in, uh, in, uh, in Brazil, whether or not, not we agree, it, uh, agree with it or not. But in Hungary, in terms of like the economy, for instance, let me just uh, share you some thoughts of some others. Not, not it is not our thoughts because uh, it is uh, uh, an area in which we are not uh, uh, experts. So, as for the economy, uh, Gabor Shearing um, from Hungary is saying that 
uh, what we are having is not economic liberalism anymore, but authoritarian capitalism. Uh, we have Chaba Laszlo who is saying that uh, there is an ad hoc um, uh, regulatory interventionalism, nationalization, uh, sometimes followed by privatization to friends, marginalizing foreign over ownership in banking, in energy sector and trade and super lax monetary policy. And this is what uh, uh, we are having. Now, I do not have the terminology to uh, call it in a, in a way. I just uh, um, rely on these uh, uh, economists. Uh, also, Adam Fabri uh, is uh, talking about uh, authoritarian neoliberalism, which is a fusion of authoritarianism and neoliberalism. Uh, in terms of uh, the political economy of Hungary under Orbán's regime. And let me just uh, also uh, mention Noemi Landwai Beyton and uh, her co auditor, uh, who um, made some research on Hungary, uh, Poland, and Croatia. And they are saying that, yes, uh, they are having authoritarian neoliberalism, uh, plus a combination of welfare chauvinism, layered social welfare, and national populism. So this is how they they saw it. Now, if you um, if you can just like you know uh, define what it is, it's good for you. I I really I I wouldn't dare as this is not my field of specialty. And exactly this is why in our book we we have our like constitutional law perspective, and we really do not engage with this discussion in the literature about the political economy, which of course has a connection to, to the isms like liberalism or illiberalism, but we decided not to deal with that. And that is exactly why, because we feel that there is a gap here. So this is why I just offered uh, as a new or a further research topic to go more on this path and, and just discover what illiberalism means and, uh, and what it, uh, it, it is not. Uh, so the second uh, uh, question was about whether informal rules can overturn formal rules. Um, I think that uh, in a like healthy constitutional democracy, if you have a, like a bad formal rule and there are like informal practices, they can overturn them. Yes, without uh, without doubt, and uh, it would be even a good thing. I don't think that we are uh, Hungary and Poland. We are there. <laughs> we already passed that phase. I think. I don't think that uh, uh, that illiberal rules uh, could like overturn bad formal practices here. It is not the case. What is the case in Hungary and Poland or what has been the case is that informal rules are the bad ones were like the illiberal ones were overturning formal ones, the good substantive constitutional democracy rules. And you asked for uh, you asked about the abortion. Uh, to my knowledge, um, it uh, and uh, about civil society, the role of civil society in this informal change. Uh, I think that what was in in, uh, in Poland the situation. Uh, but if I'm wrong, Agnieszka is here, fortunately, and she can correct me. So um, what happened with this uh, abortion issue is that there has always been, uh, you know, and there are everywhere there are supporters uh, of abortion and there are those who are against abortion and of course uh, they can influence the decision maker the policy maker and then it happened in uh, in uh, in Poland as well I think that from the side of this type of civil society from the side of the civil society it is just they were like louder or they uh, get more um, uh, attention from the political decision maker and this is how they could uh, achieve their goal, the, uh, even uh, more severe uh, abortion laws. Uh, I think that this is just uh, the advice that you asked about or what you would uh, think to be healthy in a society. Um, the benchmark, uh, the third question about, um, um, yeah, European rule of law. Uh, yes. Um, when I was talking to somebody, I don't even remember to whom, uh, he, he was. Uh, he, he said that 
uh, yes, you have this uh, notion about European rule of law, but it is not as easy as you think. It's not as comprehensive as you think. Yes, but what it is then? So if you can come up with another notion, it's fine. And uh, then we thought that for, for us, for the purpose of this research, the European rule of the concept of the European rule of law uh, would be would be just uh, fine. And if others want to, to you know, make a discussion with us, we are we are open to any discussion. Um, I noted also the um, the risk of generalization uh, in terms of um, uh, uh, historical trajectory, emotional trajectory, and this is yes, stereotypes, yes, they are dangerous, but sometimes they are useful. And now this is a, also a challenge, I haven't put it there, but it is also a challenge when you want to involve another discipline which you are not familiar with, I mean, we are lawyers, uh, so how you just avoid the risk of not being uh, very professional. Uh, we try to do our best uh, during our research with Agnieszka to um, interpret those research results on the, um, of, of the social uh, psychologists uh, uh, as, as they, 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 they wanted maybe us to, to, to understand what they are saying. But uh, you can find in our book that, um, even though they they did the research about the value orientation and and the emotional trajectory of Hungarians and Poles uh, here uh, now I mean not now but like uh, I don't know how many years ago they correspondent they correspondent they are correspondent to the observations of our um, of our authors and uh, professors uh, from the. Uh, um 50s even from the uh, authors and poets from the beginning of the 20th century and i can go back to the 16th century so you can find some examples in the book and i think that i i should uh, uh, stop talking because then no one would want to buy the book and read what exactly we are uh, arguing about and uh, why thank you Thank you so much, Tima. Uh, so we should start now with the, the questions from the uh, audience. Uh, I would like to make a, a first question, a small one, I think, uh, uh, Tima, and just for people just to get in, in shape for, for doing their questions. You can open your cameras if you want it and your mics and do your questions. Personally, we don't have so many people right now at the at the meeting, so uh, it, it is easy to do it. But uh, I was wondering on the, the gradualness of uh, the, that feature of uh, liberal constitutionalism. And uh, I was comparing again with the case here of Brazil. Of course, we will do it all the time. Uh, and especially in the time that uh, uh, Tim stays here in Brazil, that uh, we will try to do this kind of comparative effort. Uh, 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 so, uh, uh, it took something like 10 years for Hungary to reach the point where uh, is it now? Uh, in Brazil, we had, uh, we could say actually that the government from, that the Bolsonaro's government is the, is the most aggressive uh, uh, government towards uh, the basis of uh, constitutional democracy. Uh, but th there is another, uh, th this idea of gradualness, it, it doesn't appear so clear uh, in the way by which Bolsonaro governs Brazil. It seems that he has a much more uh, direct or violent approach to constitutional institutions. Uh, but at the same time, people are getting used to it. So his attacks that were seen uh, at the start of his government as something, this is scandalous, this is very intrusive, he cannot do it. Now people are saying, oh, he's talking about it again, and people are getting used to it. And there is a, 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 an important idea here that is the idea of normalization. And this is something that I saw, uh, for instance, uh, 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 Ivan Krastev and Stephen Holmes describing it, this phenomenon in Russia, or I think that even in, in Hungary. So uh, how is this process? Is, is there something uh, on this idea of normalization when people are getting used to that kind of authoritarian practices uh, and I think that uh, this is something that communicates with the idea that uh, if you have an authoritarian predisposition, it is easier for a populist or an authoritarian persona to govern uh, that uh, jurisdiction and uh, 
destroy uh, democratic and constitutional uh, uh, features uh, that are there. So uh, just a comment on this process of normalization. Uh, I think that Thomas wants to make a question. If any other one wants to make it, maybe we could do, could do something like that, a round of three questions and then go back to Tim. Yeah? So Thomas, please. Uh, hi, Emilio. I think that my question uh, goes in the same direction as you, because uh, I would like to emphasize the point of, of persistence. Uh, when you talk about gradualization, I think that there is a persistence. And I think that these guys, uh, they have, an, at least in Brazil, the Bolsonaristas, they have this kind of attitude that they are permanently mobilized. So they want to win by exhaustion. So they, they, they keep repeating the same story again and again, and, 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 and they create some sort of default uh, position for them. Like you, you, they put uh, the liberals and the people who would like to resist their ideology in the defensive because you have to uh, undermine the, their claims, claims all the time. It's like uh, when they, and they do it with the institutions as well. They do it with the Supreme Court. Like they, they, they file many claims in the court that they know they're going to lose because they want to blame the courts for the decisions that they know that the courts are going to take. That happened uh, uh, recently in the case of the, of the parliamentary inquiry. They, 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 they lost in court, but they, they tried to win the battle on WhatsApp and the internet because they wanted to keep this, uh, this rhetoric that the courts are to blame for uh, uh, the, the state of affairs, for corruption, for the decline of, of, of religious values and, and, and the, the, the takeover of the people uh, of, the, of, of public morality by LGBTQ uh, and whatever. So I think that this is one of the questions that I would like to uh, add to Emilio's idea like the persistence, but also uh, the graduality, but also the persistence. They, they, they want to create some sort of a, a, a civil war or a communication war. Uh, that's one of the questions that I would have for you. Uh, the second question uh, was about the battle, the battle between religion and, 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 and rationality and religion and liberalism, religion and democracy. I, I don't know if in Hungary is the same, but my idea is that uh, in Brazil, uh, uh, one of the reasons why Bolsonaroists are so uh, convinced of, of their superiority and, and the idea that they, are, they have some sort of special entitlement to rights that no one else has, I think that this has to have to do a lot with, with religion and, and the role uh, that these people want religion to play in politics. I would like to see if you have the same sense uh, of what's going on in Brazil and perhaps other parts of the world. Thank you. Thank you, Thomas. Uh, anyone else wants to add the third question? So Tima can answer. Emilio, I think I can do the last one. Okay, so Ulysses, please. Uh, Professor Timia, I, I have a tiny question for you. Uh, comparing this situation we face in Brazil with Hungary, especially about the institutions that goes against the incumbents, uh, that still goes against. In Brazil, we have the Brazilian uh, Supreme Court, the STF, that seems to, to, to make some movements against the government, especially in this last year in this pandemic. And the STF, the Supreme Court, uh, did some investigations uh, in the last year, in, in this, this current year, uh, against the, the supporters of the government uh, about some acts that many, uh, many see as anti-democratic. And some authors, some researchers are investigating these movements of Brazilian Supreme Court as acts like a, a concept called militant democracy. Then my question for you is about how can you see or how do you see uh, this concept, this concept of militant democracy in this environment of illiberal constitutionalism, of democratic erosion? Uh, is, if this concept is still valid 
to work with these environments, please. Kimia? Yes, I'm here. Thank you. I'm just uh, uh, looking in my computer. Thank you so much for these excellent questions. So let us compare now. Um, um, let me start with this um, value orientation I mentioned, okay? So what I would like to share with you is the result of the, um, the research on value orientation and emotional trajectory of the Hungarians and Poles. So first values, uh, there, are the, there, are, there are these mastery values which are uh, which emphasize um, uh, getting ahead through active self-assertion, through changing and mastering the natural and social environment, such as like ambition and success. Now, these kind of uh, values uh, have low importance in Western societies, according to that research, and uh, they have even less importance in Eastern European uh, uh, societies. Uh, effective uh, autonomy values and conservative values in Western uh, societies, uh, the affective autonomy values have more importance and uh, conservative values have less importance according to studies. While uh, in Eastern European uh, societies, uh, the more important is the conservatism and hierarchy. So the respect of hierarchy, it's hierarchical way of thinking. Initiative and achievement uh, got more appreciation in Western societies than in Eastern European uh, states. And tolerance to outgroups and post-material values such as freedom and social responsibility are more shown in Western uh, societies than in uh, Eastern uh, uh, Europe, Europe uh, Eastern Europe, sorry, Eastern Europe. Um, and what it uh, also means, uh, so based on these type of studies and the history, uh, let us not go uh, into the details of Hungarian and, and, and Polish history here, but there is a kind of feeling of being a victim. So there is a collective victimhood, which is then triggered by, by these, these illiberal regimes. So that is where I can connect maybe to Thomas' question to the entitlement that that we we are superior or or not we but those who are with us we are better we are superior we, we have some title some kind of entitlement uh, against the european union it is because of this uh, um, uh, triggered feelings of and abused feelings of collective victimhood and also collective narcissism so there is an inferiority feeling maybe and then it is triggered by uh, the regime and even if we cannot like talk about uh, Thomas like civil or uh, communication war, but a little bit maybe uh, we, I mean, how it is described in Hungary, it's a culture war maybe, and there is an enemy creation. So the persistence is in the continuous creation of enemy because we need an enemy because now we don't want to be victim anymore. We are better. We, we, uh, we have always fought about and, and those, but now we, we are freedom fighters and now we will defend everybody, which gives us entitlement to fight against, to fight against the European Union, for instance, or even against the uh, human dignity of others. Uh, so it is not like uh, here that uh, there is a continuous mobilization, a continuous mobilization in the sense of uh, creating these enemies. So the first enemy around 15 was, were the migrants. And now the actual enemy was actually the pandemic. Uh, and now we have the LGBTQ. So uh, there are enemies all the time. And um, uh, it, it, in Hungary, and I think in Poland too, it is not about putting opposition in, in defense uh, in the sense that you just described with the court. Uh, why? Because um, um, there is, uh, I mean, what they are defending is uh, uh, the system is defending itself. Okay. So, answering to Thomas, it is not about the religion, it's about the feelings, collective victim of collective narcissism. And it is, uh, there is a kind of communication war, war but it is more about uh, enemy creation. 
and it go it brings me to militant democracy. So it is um, a term to to express that you you can use some kind of like um, extreme measures to keep your own liberal democracy intact, right? So now uh, the question was how I can interpret this uh, in the Hungarian and Polish um, uh, context. It, I interpret it as, as an abusive militant democracy because they have the measures, they have the tools to defend their own illiberal regime. With this uh, act, like just adopted yesterday, okay, against the LGBTQ community. They are defending the children, they are defending the culture, they are defending everything. Uh, there is an enemy, again, yeah, so it is an example of enemy creation. And now they are defending us, they are defending uh, uh, our culture, uh, Christianity, uh, and, uh, and our, our uh, yeah, culture, basically, and the children. So uh, it is an abusive use of the otherwise good um, uh, measures of uh, militant democracy. By the way, uh, Agnieszka and myself, we were uh, part in a, um, a research group about quasi-militant democracy in the post-communist or post-socialist state. Hopefully a book is coming out uh, which would uh, feature uh, uh, chapters about uh, the states and the militant democracy or quasi-militant democracy nature of our states in our region. And um, to Emilio, um, I think that I more or less answered your question when I referred to uh, the emotional uh, status of, of Hungarians and uh, and uh, and Poles. Obviously, it is not like everybody, okay? It is a research. And um, I cannot say that it is even the majority, you never know, but it seems that those majority of the population who has these feelings, who have this belief that they need a charismatic leader, they go to, to the election and they are in majority. Um, yes, people are getting used to it, uh, I think so. Uh, but gradualness, what we, we mean under that is rather than the attack uh, against the substantive constitution democracy didn't occur uh, overnight. So for, there were small steps uh, on the way. And uh, so it, it, you can imagine it's like, like a, a, a liberal like constitutionalism, and then it has its, its puzzles. And then the first puzzle appeared and a couple of months, a year later, the other puzzle and things like that. So, um, so people are, yeah, 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 I think you said I wanted to say something about that. It is very important uh, what you mentioned about it, because uh, uh, if you consider the university situation in Hungary, so no one cared. And I mean, there were some people, but they were not strong enough. And this is what we... Uh, refer to when we are saying that the civil society is not strong enough. So there were, you read it, so there were some criticism, some, some uh, protest uh, against uh, kicking out the uh, CEU from Hungary, but uh, actually no one cared. Other universities didn't care. You couldn't see uh, a united front against this uh, governmental approach to a, to a, a fellow higher education institution, which is a university. No one cared. And then they started to privatize uh, three years ago, one of the universities, and no one cared. And then they came to take the others too. And what, I mean, more and more. So there was like only one, and then the CEO kicked out, privatized one or two, and then a year later, like a couple of more, and in this year, like many. Okay, and so this also indicates the weakness of civil society, maybe that they don't care because they just hope that uh, no one would uh, take them to, but we should have learned that it is not the case. We had 40 years of socialism, so um, we should have learned it, but uh, maybe it is not what happened. Thank you very much, Timia. Uh, we can do another round of questions if uh, anyone in the audience uh, wants to. Someone else wants to add another question to Professor Timia. 
or comment. So, uh, there's a person, Max, wants to make a question. Oh, Maybe. yes, please, Max Stoyer. Uh, yes, uh, if I may, uh, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you very much, uh, Timia, for the fascinating uh, presentation and quite challenging, actually, for those who um, believe in this uh, inherent link between some form of liberalism and, and constitutionalism. Uh, what I was wondering about um, is uh, that you highlighted how you disentangle liberalism and constitutionalism, but do you do the same with democracy and constitutionalism? So it seems to me that if we accept uh, illiberal constitutionalism as a model, we essentially do not distinguish between democracy and constitutionalism. So regardless of whether um, they are illiberal, illiberal democracy, illiberal constitutionalism, or liberal, liberal democracy, liberal constitutionalism, it seems that paradoxically they, they coexist, perhaps even co-originate, which just seems very strange to me. I might be missing uh, some, some element in the, in the reasoning here. I haven't had a chance to read the book yet, but I was wondering of whether, whether you also make some sort of disentangling between democracy or constitutionalism, or whether you in fact connect these, these two. And if I may, a second uh, small question. I, I was wondering what theory of democracy, if any, serves as an inspiration for your definition um, of, of democracy. Of course, your, your project isn't about democracy primarily, but you come to that term and you, you use it from, from time to time. Um, and so I was wondering whether there is a theory of democracy behind. So uh, the natural choice could be the minimalist theory of democracy uh, that perhaps allows coexistence of liberalism and democracy. Uh, but even there, there, there seems to be some requirement for free and fair elections if we take Robert Dahl. Uh, for example, and, and that requirement doesn't seem to be met uh, in Hungary. So I, I'm wondering whether there is perhaps some, some other inspiration, theoretical inspiration that you take uh, for your approach to, to democracy, even though I, I recognize that that is not the main scope or main, main concept that you work with in the, in the project. Thank you very much. I think you're muted. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. sorry. Uh, any other one wants to add another question? Uh, so we have the first one made by Max Stoyer. Timia, do, do you want to answer this one and then we can? Yes, yes, thank you, Max. Uh, yeah, actually, we have already made some. Um, uh, what discussion with Max about this and that terminology. Uh, and Max, thank you very much for your question. Uh, now, can I ask a question? Uh, why do you, do you think that uh, there are no free and fair elections in Hungary? How would you measure whether it was, whether we have free and fair? What does it mean exactly? And as compared to what? So that would be because you just say, stated that. I'm not saying that I disagree uh, uh, with your statement. I think that I disagree with the conclusion that there is no, not at all, free and fair elections. Uh, um, and yes, um, we got this, uh, <laughs> this critic, obviously, that uh, even if we are working with the minimum uh, minimal theory of democracy, free and fair election, uh, there are no free and fair elections, so we cannot use the word democracy uh, and because there is no democracy. And uh, we just, uh, uh, what we did was that we had to look at those uh, indices I mentioned in the presentation, and uh, I also have them actually uh, with me uh, in a, you know in a table format they are in the, in the book as well and so I think that one of the challenge maybe we fail I don't know uh, you will tell us when you read the book and then you will have a chance to read the book uh, when it's published so maybe we failed in that uh, but we still think that if you have a look at the numbers the figures uh, of these uh, indices you can see that uh, 
that we are not, not there yet, like where, where Russia and, and Turkey is. And, and also uh, like uh, quantitatively speaking and qual neither qualitative, uh, but it, it could deteriorate obviously. Um, so this is the one uh, part of, of my answer. And the second is, if I understood you well, so you, you are saying for you, uh, democracy equals constitutionalism, right? And uh, I try to explain, uh, I'm, this bothered me all the time. Maybe I'm, I'm not as educated or, or learned as I think that, that I am, but uh, I also, I, I, I always thought that if you have like different expression, then they, could, they, they must mean different things. And I also think that uh, you, could, uh, you could have different terminology uh, in, um, I don't know, in the United States and, 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 and in Europe, because now your constitutional development is not the same. And so uh, the question is, and the challenge whether you can borrow the, those, those, those concepts and, and describe your state. Uh, another question or challenge is uh, whether those who are like uh, analyzing your state, which is in the Central and Eastern Europe, and those who are not coming from Central and Eastern Europe. So they are using their own terminology, their own way of thinking, they, they based on their, their, their way of thinking on their education and training. So whether you could uh, speak uh, the same language or not. And uh, again, here we might be wrong with Agnieszka, of course, uh, but um, uh, how we were trained, were like we, as I said in the presentation, we prefer to call uh, our state after uh, the transition, uh, uh, 1989 and 1990, constitutional democracy, which is the constitutional form of democracy. What it means that uh, uh, everything, the state of affairs, the relationship between the, the state and the people and the people themselves are governed uh, by the constitution and the popular sovereignty is there and the processes are democratic, uh, involvement, uh, um, like rational majoritarian uh, decision making process and so on and so forth. So this is what we call like constitutional democracy. It could be said that this is liberal constitutionalism because uh, as opposed to the socialist system, we do, we did have rule of law, human rights protection uh, and uh, the, the, the democracy, meaning that the, it was really the people who could decide in an election on who would uh, be their representatives in the parliament, which was not uh, the case in the socialist system. So when we had the new constitutional structure after the transition, and this is what I said, that we get everything as a package, a kind of liberal way of thinking, a kind of uh, 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 constitutionalism, a new constitution a uh, year later in Poland, substanti substantively new constitution in the very beginning in Hungary. So for us, that is the constitutional democracy. From others, it could be liberal constitutional democracy. And in, in this understanding of ours, this constitutional democracy obviously are, is like, um, in it, Liberalism is featured. If you see liberalism from our constitutional perspective uh, as, a, as the prevalence of, of liberty, of freedom, of the individual, which we call like protection of human rights, right? And that is one element. And the second element is that there are no arbitrary powers in, in the state, rule of law. We have it, had it. And uh, that uh, the, the people can express their political opinion in a democratic election. And that is what we call democracy. Okay, so the, it is a, like a narrow sense of, of democracy as a constituent element of the substantive constitutional democracy. And this uh, uh, small democracy or more restrictive concept of democracy, you can call it um, uh, uh, the minimalist theory of democracy. Uh, but I would also add that maybe you should consider uh, that also the lawmaking process needs to be democratic uh, with all the involvement and rationality and, and evidence-based uh, decision-making process. So um, if you are looking for, I think, and I'm completely honest now in, in front of the people of the internet, uh, if you are looking for a comprehensive philosophy 
behind our uh, notion of democracy, you might not find it uh, from the perspective that you are looking for. And um, I hope that I answered uh, your question. I hope that I could like explain uh, this difference between our mindset, again, we, when we use the term constitutional democracy to describe our constitutional reality after the transition up to 10 and 15 in Poland. Uh, thank you. And please, Max, uh, read our book then, and then we can talk. Thank you, Timia. Uh, anyone else? Any further question? All right. Uh, I will thank again, Professor Timia, for such uh, a- Emilio, okay. if, there is, if there's time, I would like to make one. Just okay, to... right, right, yeah. yeah. yeah so, uh, I, I was leaving it the space for someone else, but since no one showed up, perhaps I would like to do that. Uh, just to point that, uh, uh, me and Emilio, we did in our in our piece for the journal that you're editing. Uh, one of our points was that norms. Uh, we came from the inferentialist understanding of norms, in the sense that norms come in package. And one of, you, you, when democracy fails, it doesn't fail alone. Normally, it fails together with the rule of law, together with human rights, together with equ economic equality, together. And so illiberalism uh, in our interpretation uh, works by uh, an attitude of turning one norm against the other. And I think I see this exactly in Bolsonaro's speech when he claims that the, uh, I am protecting your liberty, but you do that by inflicting the liberty of everyone else and equality and, and federalism and, and and democracy, but they put one, they turn one norm against the other. And, and in the sense that this, uh, this strategy undermines the rationality behind the rule of law. Do you see this movement in, in Hungary as well? Because I think that this is, is one of the points that uh, Max's question would be, would be helpful because uh, uh, if you think that uh, norms work well when they work together, uh, I think uh, perhaps we could, uh, we could reconsider the idea of, of separating all the values. This is interesting for the point of view of legal theory. To, to understand them, you can separate them. Uh, to, to understand what, the, what liberalism is, what democracy is, what the rule of law is. But uh, when you turn to the practice, uh, my intuition would be that they only work when they work together. And, and, and I think that illiberals know that. And because they know that, they turned one arm, one arm against the other. Uh, so I would like you to, to consider this point, yeah. Thank you, Thomas. Uh, it was very enlightening reading that article and the others you co-authored uh, with uh, Professor um, e Conrado Lindner Mendes, right? That was the other one, yes. So, uh, which is about to be published, hopefully. Uh, I think that what you just described, this is what we call illiberal legality. And so that is just a quick answer. The other answer is that uh, we uh, do not separate, I mean, we have to, as you said, like rule of law, democracy and, and human rights, but they are like interconnected, obviously. And, and you, don't do, you cannot talk about the one without the other, but it doesn't mean that they are like uh, the same concepts at all. And I completely agree with you that uh, illiberal leaders know that. And uh, how it is um, um, going in Hungary that uh, everybody, everything is, is legal. So first, they, they make the legal environment as they want it to be. And then, which is like um, a, a kind of abusive legal environment. And then they comply with their own laws. Sometimes they don't. But in the majority of cases, they comply with their own laws. And then they can say that, hey, now, everything is legal. Uh, hierarchy is, uh, is uh, observed. And I'm just implementing the law because I have to implement the law. And then, if it is, if it means that um, what that uh, universities are just privatized from from one moment to the other, then then they are privatized, no matter what, not no matter whether they have actually been involved in the lawmaking process 
which is about them, right? But so that is not important because uh, in our system, the lawmaking process starts when the bill is before the, the parliament. And so the constitutional court would uh, not uh, examine whether you uh, organize the proper uh, uh, participation, involvement, consultation or not. So it doesn't matter. So that's why, uh, because the government knows that the constitutional court would not care. And they also know that uh, uh, because it is in the jurisprudence, and they would not care because of the composition. So they just skip that process and then they do a proper parliamentary proceeding with all the steps and then they adopt the law. And then everybody is unhappy. I mean, not everybody because you cannot see big uh, uh, protests against this, uh, this uh, privatization of the universities, uh, but other type of protests, I, I don't want to really uh, go there. So just sum it up. I think that yes, you are right, I completely agree. And I was like, wow, uh, when I was reading that article uh, about Bolsonarism and the, is that, hey, this is what is happening in Hungary too, wait, yeah, good. But then you could, in the paper, you could indicate something which I could like uh, 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 call as a, as a theory behind it. Uh, but I, I, I fail to see it in Hungary. This is, this is, so the, the mechanism are the same, but it seems to be that here in Brazil, uh, there is uh, something like theory behind it. And here, there, Hungary, there is not. Or at least that was my understanding of your paper. Perhaps not theory, but strategy. There, okay, there yeah, strategy, uh, more relevant, strategy, more relevant. It's very well planned. Mm, yeah. yeah. So, thank you. yes, you see, uh, thank you. Thank you so much. I, I'm happy to be here, actually. So, um, um, I have already learned a lot, as I said. And thank you for this opportunity for today and for this visiting professorship as well. Thank you, it was wonderful. Thank you so much, uh, Thomas. Thank you, uh, Timia, for the, your presentation. Thank you, Juliana, for cooperating with us today in this discussion. Thank you all in the audience that were that joined us uh, today, uh, Gniezka, several researchers from uh, Brazil and uh, all around the world, uh, Professor Ivanilda from uh, the University of uh, Vissosa, uh, Professor Ligia Fabris uh, from FGV uh, Rio de Janeiro, Professor Majorie Maron, our colleague here at UFMG, Professor Richard Albert, always a supporter of our initiatives. Uh, thank you so much. We have another seminar series, uh, another seminar uh, 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 scheduled for the, the 16th July. It will be on uh, abusive constitutional borrowing with the, the professors, with professors uh, uh, Rosalind Dixon and uh, uh, David Lando and comments by Professor Mila Festek. So join us in our next uh, talk and thank you so much again to everyone. Thank you. Congratulations.